Hey everybody, Larry Lawton here. Got a good video for you today. I'm going to be talking about my last 10 days in the United States Penitentiary Atlanta. A lot of people ask me to start narrating my certain times in certain prisons, uh, which I'm going to do. So I'm going to start out with USP Atlanta, my last 10 days in USP Atlanta. And it was probably the scariest or the most uh, uh, apprehensive. I didn't know if I'd live or die. And I'll get into that here in a minute. Before I get started, check us out on YouTube member programs, Patreon member programs. Check out our merch. Check out my book, Gangster Redemption. You can get it in the links below. I thought I'd get into this video and really give you an idea of what it was like to be in the United States Penitentiary Atlanta. My last 10 days there. Now, you got to remember, at this time... I was in Atlanta. I was in Atlanta for almost two years. I think it was 22 months, so almost two years. So the last 10 days were the scariest 10 days. I guess you could call them the scariest 10 days of, of my life, if you want to call it that. And I, and I actually do. I hope you guys like my lighter. But I thought I'd relax. I thought I'd tell you the story. I would tell you why it was and why it was so crazy and how, how it even got crazier near the end. Now, I, I get to Atlanta, you gotta remember, I, I just got a new sentence. I was four 12 year sentences. Now you think that's a lot of time? In Atlanta, it was like a fucking uh, drop in a bucket. Uh, in Atlanta, we had 800 people, eight, over 800 people with life sentences. I think it was 880 at one time we counted. 800 and some odd people with life sentences never getting out. Uh, then you had a lot of other guys and people often ask me, who, who, what kind of people go to Federal penitentiaries, they go the worst of the worst. Hit men, mob bosses, drug dealers, no no petty stuff, real stuff, armed robbers, guys like me. Uh, so, you know, we were, we were in that field. So everybody around you is, is a dangerous person. Let me just put it that way in, in uh, saying it there. So I'm in Atlanta, let me give you a little piece of Atlanta, and, and I don't know how much most of you guys watch some of our videos. Go check out Atlanta. Atlanta was just closed down for having so much corruption. They literally had to take every inmate out. I think they're bringing them back now. I don't know how they're going to fix that fucking place. Uh, most places are tough to be fixed. That one is a zoo. When I was there, it was the worst prison in the United States. We had a murder a month for 18 months. Think of that. Not counting overdoses. Not counting suicides. Not counting all the other suspicious shit that happens in prison. I'm talking murders. Everybody knew somebody who got killed there or stabbed there or something happened to somebody there. It's just the way the place was. It was a dungeon. You know, they had what they call a new section of the prison. I was there when they even had the, the old movie theater. And uh, they had a, the old kitchen and stuff. But I talk about Big Ben, the big rat that was that big. Uh, but we'll get into a little bit more of that later or in another video, but I'm talking about my last 10 days in USP Atlanta. So I'm giving you a picture of Atlanta. Now, first of all, in Atlanta, I was there now, again, for almost two years. I knew the ropes, I knew the people, I knew the clicks, I knew where the drugs were. You wanted cocaine over there, you want weed over there, alcohol over there, heroin over there. Literally within, you know, a space of uh, two big houses and you can get any drug you want. So, here we are, I'm in Atlanta, I know the ropes. I did book making, we used to do the alcohol, we used to cook alcohol up. I'm gonna tell you how we did that and what we did in Atlanta as well. But we used to like cook alcohol and we used to sell it. Now you'd sell what they, we used to call it a neck. You'd sell a neck, you want a neck, it was five dollars or a book of stamps. So you'd sell a neck of wine it was in a, in a little garbage bag. We had garbage bags. We make it. We actually, you know, the coffee uh, Nest Cafe coffee cups. That is a neck. That was a quart, and you'd actually fill that up, put that in a thing. That was five dollars. Now, if we cooked it off, it would take a lot more than that because we would make white lightning, which is pure alcohol. But that's all other stuff. I'm just giving you an idea of the environment it was. So every weekend, people were fucked up doing shit, going to the yard, doing acid, doing everything. You know, whatever you wanted in Atlanta, you can get. There's no question about that. So we're, as we're in Atlanta, I know everybody. As a matter of fact, my cellie was a guy named Dave, and uh, he won an appeal to get out. He was a bank robber, and he wins an appeal to get out, and he was just fucking such shell shock. 
he owed me a hundred and something bucks or whatever it is. Comes back into my cell and he goes, he, Larry, I'll pay you. Uh, uh, I don't want to. And I go, what the fuck are you talking about? He was like, this guy was in shell check. This guy was in his 30s like me, probably 35 years old. And he was a bank robber and, and a serial bank robber, meaning it wasn't his first rodeo. He goes, he comes back into the cell. And this is during the day. And at that time, I used to work the East Yard. The East Yard was where you go. Uh, go out near where the metal detector was and you know you pick up trash and a little thing And it was really a job so I can help transfer knives and shanks and everything else through the metal detectors Because I had this thing and I talked to someone they put it there I'd pick it up bring it get it through the metal detector and and it go you know it, it, We had so many kind of things like that. We stuck up with each other but anyway, Dave comes into the cell and he goes, I, I, I know I owe you money. Uh, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, I said, what the fuck are you talking about? Uh, he goes, I'm going to pay you. He goes, but R&D called and said, I'm getting out. Get down to R&D. I says, what? He goes, yeah, I want an appeal. I'm so happy for this guy. I'm ecstatic. He's being told to go to R&D, which is receiving and discharge, and check out. He's in the cell and he starts packing shit. Now you, you take your legal work, obviously, but no, he starts putting a cup in there. He puts soap, you know, laundry soap. You're doing a washing machine. And I'm like, what's wrong with you, Dave? He goes, maybe my parents don't have a laundry detergent. And I'm like, this guy's fucking out there, whacked. He was in shell shock, shell shock. Now, I've been there a while, so I know the ropes. I'm telling everybody we're all hanging out. Back in those days, you could also smoke. You used to smoke cigars. I used to smoke the Denable cigars. I got to bring one of them back and, and smoke it here. I, I actually like them. And they were like the old Clint Eastwood cigar in Good, Bad, and the Ugly, if you remember that. You know, you had one of those cigars. So, here we are. He gets out. I tell everybody. I end up getting a new celly. Because you pick your celly in Atlanta. It wasn't like... Hey, you know, uh, let, let, let them put somebody in your cell. That didn't happen. So you figure out who's with who. You want to come with me? Yeah, we're cool. We party. We hang. Whatever it is, you're going to be in my cell. So I ended up getting a new cell. Yeah, I was there for a little bit. So here we are. At, it was six. I, I, I remember it was on a Sunday, and it was at 6 o'clock at night. And now a lot of people go to the yard. They go to the yard after chow. Now chow happens at after 4, four o'clock count. They start releasing at 4.30 out of your cells whenever, once count clears. So now they clear count. And now everybody waits around their unit to be called for chow. You wait around. They don't just say chow call to the whole prison. Because if they did that, the place would be flooded and it would be a zoo. And you didn't want that. So they would call units as they this was another bullshit thing even in Atlanta but they really didn't give a shit whoever had the cleanest unit or something like a one something would get to be called first for chow now it was good to be called first for chow because once you're done eating you can go to the yard you can come back to the unit you can do whatever you want now if you're the last unit now remember we had nine units so if you're the ninth unit to be called you're waiting near the door and it's a pain in the ass and then Chow's near the end. They try to rush you to get the fuck out of there. Then you go to the yard and already things have already happened or whatever. Or people on the handball court, you got to wait, whatever it is. So here we are. It's one time. So it's a Sunday and it's football Sunday. And I had a football ticket, you know, so I used to watch the games, knew what everybody was doing. When I say I have a football ticket, it's some of the things I actually started when I was a kid. Uh, I, I, I didn't start, obviously, but I worked for the book, The Mobsters, who had me making, at 11 and 12 years old, I'm making $125 a week. And I was doing that because I was a hustler. Well, my hustling ways goes right to prison, of course. So, here's what happened. So, I'm in, I put my chair. In Atlanta, we actually had metal chairs, believe it or not, folding metal chairs. Now, what you would do is you would go stick your chair in the TV room for you to either watch a movie if you're gonna be in that at night, sports TV rooms where I was at night, whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna watch what's going on. So I put my chair in the TV room against the wall in the back. I go to chow, I come back. I didn't go to the yard that night. I didn't wanna to go to the yard that night. Now the yard uh, has recall at eight o'clock. So here it is only 
probably five o'clock. Go to chow, come back. I put my chair up. I'm getting stuff. I'm still getting stuff like I wanted a little uh, bowl of food myself or something I wanted. So I go and I put my chair right there in, in the TV room and I go do something in my, in my cell. I come back and this guy named Bonnie's sitting in my chair. Well, he was an Indian American and knew him well, knew him well. So he's sitting in my chair. I said, Bonnie, get out of my fucking chair, man. Right, so does a little grumble shit like that. And I, yeah, okay, get the fuck out of here. He goes, I, I fucking sit down. I, I eat what I'm eating. And uh, sure enough, sure enough, I eat. I'm watching what I'm watching. I go bring my bowl that I was eating something out of back into the to my cell to clean it. And I come back and guess who's in my chair again? Now it's Bonnie. Now, I say, Bonnie, what the fuck? Here's what he says. He goes, you fucking guys think you run it. Meaning, he, I used to hang with the Italians. I'm not Italian, but that's, you know, the group I used to hang with, or the mobsters and all that. He goes, you guys think you run this fucking prison. Well, it was such a, a derogatory thing what he did. We're in the TV room now. This is when I came back, so I, hands are free. Everything's good. He grumbled, and he kind of gave, gave off like, like, what are you going to do about it? I hit him so fucking hard, he goes against the wall. The back wall. It's a concrete wall. And I grab him. I got him by the head now. And I'm hitting him with uppercuts. I'm fucking hitting. Bam, bam. His head's going boom, boom, boom. He was literally out on his feet. He was out on his fucking feet. He fucking falls down the fucking wall. Matter of fact, an AB there uh, ran to prison. A guy I wouldn't want to fuck with. He grabbed my shoulder. And that's never done in prison. He grabbed, I would, you know, you turn around quick. Thank God I didn't hit him. And I am, I'm so fucking hyped up, man. He says, go to your cell. You know, like, just get out of here, go. And I fucking go, and I'm hyped up like a motherfucker. I mean, I'm ready to fight. He's fucking gone on the floor. And I'm fucking, I mean, your adrenaline is flowing. When you, when you fight, your adrenaline flows. Trust me, your adrenaline will flow. So here I am, I'm in the fucking, in my cell, and in comes Reno. Reno has got life sentences, he's got three life sentences, killed people, and he was a fucking killer, but I, I taught him how to be a bookmaker. I taught him how to be a, a you know, a, be, be a, a bookmaker, a gambler, or like a casino in the prison. And he was a feared motherfucker. He's a crazy motherfucker. He once was gonna kill a guy for $40. $40 at a fucking shank. I'm in my cell now. It's about 30, 40 minutes after this fight. I'm trying to calm myself down. And I'm thinking, oh fuck, oh fuck. Now I know I'm in for a transfer already. Meaning uh, my points came down and they were gonna transfer me to another prison. I was actually going to Coleman Prison, which is in Central Florida. So I'm heading to, I'm not heading, that's where I, I know where I'm going. So I'm fucking in the cell and in comes Reno. He goes, fucking Larry, we gotta kill the chief. We gotta kill him. When he comes back, we gotta kill him. My fucking, my life is going in front of my eyes. Literally in front of my eyes. Now the chief stood about six foot six, seven, 300 and something pounds. He was the head of the Indians. They called him chief. I, I mean, they, we had a sweat lodge. We used to go out there and party in and shit. Uh, but that's a religious thing, but you're not supposed to do that, but of course we did it. So here I am in the prison. I'm fucking hyped up. I got fucking Reno coming in saying, when the chief comes back, we got to kill him. You know they're going to fucking kill you. You know that? Then there's no way. If I, I'm like, my fucking, my, my whole fucking life is flashing in front of my eyes. I always had three shanks around my cell. Uh, in Atlanta, it's a very old, old prison. So they had pipes above your door, like outside your door, above your door. So I had a knife, I, I, a shank, a knife, up on top of that pipe. You could not see it from any other angle and it was taped there with a piece of masking tape. So it was up there. I know I could always get to that knife and I used to check it every now and then, make sure it's there. There was a one angle you could see it. So I'd always know it was there. I didn't even tell anybody that. Nobody knew that knife was there. I had another knife in my bed underneath where you can grab it at night. And I also had a really good one. I actually paid 50 bucks for it in prison. And I had that in a coffee mate coffee can. 
that I got the top off the right way and then I put it around some. Now they didn't shake it, but you still couldn't get it. I had it really, really in there good in a good way. But that was like a special one. That was sharp as shit. And then that's the one you take to the yard when you really think something's going down. It was perfect size. It was made in, in, in Unicor, which is the shops in Unicor, which we made in Atlanta. They made what they call BDU, which is battle dress uniforms. They did mail bags. And they also had, did furniture. So I'm in the here. I'm in this cell. Rena's wanting to kill this guy when he comes in. And now I'm scared. I'm, I'm nervous. I just had, my, my hands are a little bloody, but I won't clean them up. You know, he bruised on the knuckles. He never touched me. I hit him so many times. And he just, it was just, the, that's the way I was. I got the jump on the guy. Anyway, so I'm waiting. And now eight o'clock comes, it's the, it's the movement. You don't just move around in prison. I know the chief was on the yard and Randy said I was good and all that, but now that, I, I was okay with that because he was like the head of the white guys. So I'm in this place, all of a sudden fucking the move comes. Now when the move comes, I know it's like masses of people coming in, going through our unit to the middle cages to go up to A2 and A3, I'm on A1. And I'm like, okay, all right. So Reno's there, when he comes in, when he gets there, I'll be on the end, we'll kill him when he comes in. This guy's saying this, he loved me, he was from New York, he, he, he was a fucking crazy fucking kid, a Latin king, head of the things. This guy was a no joke motherfucker. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, what the fuck? You know, at this point, I just started my bid, really, a couple of years in on a 12 year bid. So I'm like, fuck, what am I gonna do, what the fuck? And I'm sitting, I said, Reno, let me, let me see. No, relax, relax, Reno, let, let me worry about it. Not five minutes after, counts close, uh, movements close, movements close, they close up, everybody's gotta be in their unit, and stuff like that. And I'm sitting on my bed, just like this, and you know, looking out the front, kind of winding down. My brain is working a zillion fucking ways. And sure enough, a fucking shadow, that's how big he was comes and I could see the shadow literally coming but he doesn't just come into my cell doesn't do anything doesn't disrespect me he kn he knocks on the frame of the door the door is open but he knocks on the frame of the door in a United States penitentiary you don't go walk in people's cells I don't give a fuck who you are what you do unless it's your buddy and you're hanging out every day and that's the open rule you have Anybody else is going to come up to your door and you see you there, they'll knock. Unless you say, come on in or whatever. Hey, yeah, what's up? Come here. They knock on your fucking, your frame. That's respect. That's your house. You got to remember, when you lived where I lived, that's your house. You live there. So here I am in the cell. Chief comes in. He knocks on the door. Hey, Chief. He, he goes, I heard everything. You're good. I heard the whole story. I just want to let you know you're good. A fucking sigh of relief comes down me. I said, okay, chief. I said, no, no, all feelings. It wasn't my fault. He goes, I know, you didn't have no explaining. Randy ended up explaining to him what happened and everything else. So here's what made me so scared. So he leaves. Now I got transfer, I'm getting transferred. I'll never forget his name. His name was Farley. Farley was my counselor. What a great dude. He was a big black guy, great guy. He used, he used to let us put the wine in the elevator shaft and wine in his office sometimes. You know, we're cooking wine, they call it. And he would he was just such a cool fucking guy. He didn't want to hurt us. Now, you keep, I never seen him do anything like bring something in like other guards I know of. But no, but Farley was a good dude. So I knew I was getting transferred. Farley wasn't gonna lie to me that I was getting out of there because my points went down, all of that shit. Now he was my counselor the whole time. I was in Atlanta for all that time and I was on A1. So he was the one when I first went there and I told the warden about the food and the warden throws me in a hole and he laughed about it, said, what the fuck you doing, Lawton, you crazy? But anyway, besides that, I know I'm getting transferred. Now, some people hate you anyway. I mean, you don't even know who you piss off in the United States Penitentiary. You could be walking down the tier and see somebody shooting heroin in their arm, fucking another guy, doing something illegal, and they're thinking, oh yeah, fucking Lawton. Lawton wants to steal my fucking dope, or wants to get my guy, or whatever the fuck they want to think. Their main's crazy anyway. I don't want any of that shit. That's why in the penitentiary, when you walk down a hall, you walk down the tier, you don't look in every cell. Keep your fucking head. You got some business in there, that's different. You just walk down the toilet. It's, it's not like 
oh, let's just fucking have a big fucking orgy here. Or well, let's have a, you know, this is like a camp time. No. This is a United States penitentiary. Everybody in there is capable of killing you. So I'm in there. Uh, and after after that has, I go to bed. I remember my celly coming out. I mean, I, that was the talk of the night. Oh, man, the fucking, these guys, these fucking long fucked them up. You should see him. I didn't see him. Didn't do anything. Now, Bonnie was no rat. Great guy. But he had that, that band, so he wore a band over so he couldn't see the bruises. And his eyes, you know, he had dark complexion, so it was good. He needed stitches under here. Didn't get him. Didn't give a fuck. I mean, you know, but he had this... That I, I call them the Indian features, if you want to call them, and uh, it, it was just he, he he didn't say a word. It was it was over. Now I didn't know it was over. You got to remember this. Now here it is. I got ten days. Little bit. You try to keep that under your hat as much as you can, because here you guys got you got guys with three life sentences, fucking murders, they're never ever getting out. You don't know if they get jealous, they're pissed, they didn't like you for something. You fucking beat them at cards. We used to play pinochle every day. We used to gamble every day. You don't know what the hell's going on. So you, you you try to keep that quiet, actually. I love my cigars. So what happens is for the next 10 days, because it was 10 days, I remember that. We had a metal chair. I used to keep the metal chair and I slept on the bottom I slept on the bottom bunk. And my cellar used to would come in, we'd talk at night and shit like that. And you know, I was known, I, I used to get fucked up with the guys, do this shit. Those last 10 days, I was really on edge because I know how these places are and I'm worried that, holy shit, I'm, I'm in big trouble here. You know, they're going to do something before I go. I take that shank out of that, that, that can. I didn't care about getting caught with a shank. I didn't give a shit. Although, if I got caught with a shank, my transfer would have been killed. I wouldn't have been going down to a... a, a Another level lower prison. No way. Lawton's staying in the penitentiary. But now I'm thinking, I need this fuck. I, I'm not going to die in this fucking prison just for a fucking transfer. I don't give a fuck. And, it, you know, a lot of things go through your mind. I was a street guy anyway. So, you know, I always prided myself on seeing trouble before it came or feeling out the crowd. I, I often tell people, to this day, I can feel tension. If there's tension going on, I can feel it in my bones. I can... I, it's everything you notice. It's how you read people. I can feel tension. So I put a chair, the metal chair, right in front of the door. So if anybody swung the door open and tried to run in on me, they would fall over that fucking chair. In all my years in prison, I never slept past 6 o'clock in the morning. Ever. Because that's when the doors open. And I always went to bed when the doors were locked. So it, it's some, you know, it's the habit you get in because you see people die, you see things happen, you know where they're gonna get you. You know, you talk to old timers, you get stuff like that. A lot of different things happen, so it's something that you really gotta understand. Well, for that next 10 days, anybody who came up to me, I was like, also hesitant. Guys were good, I can't say nobody was bad, nothing happened. I was talked to, even the head of the ABs talked to me, hey, lad, you're a stand-up guy, man, you know, everything's cool, man, good luck where you're going, whatever, and, uh, but I was always worried about the Indians trying to get back at me, or that person you fuck up. He didn't, it, you know, it, it turned out to be, I hate to say, unfounded fear, but I'll tell you what, I often talk about two times I felt fear in prison, or the most times I was most worried, that was definitely one of them. And another one when I was getting beaten in the hole in Edgefield, when they would open the main tier door, not my cell door, but I knew they were coming to get me to beat me and, and fuck me up. That is the times I felt the most, I guess, helpless, fear, you're gonna die, and everything goes through your mind. I mean, I didn't sleep for fucking 10 days. I, I probably slept fucking 30 minutes Catnap here during that night. I mean, catnap, listening to the radio, doing something, trying to knowing that it's another day, knowing. It. And I don't know the exact day I'm leaving. They don't say hey, you're leaving Thursday, you're leaving this. They come get you at 12 at night, 12 or one at night. They come get you to process you out and put you on a plane and do all the shit they're gonna do. That's how they do it. But those last 10 days, I have to say. I think back and I think about, you know, I didn't even make phone calls, you know, because I didn't want to be on a phone, vulnerable, start some shit. Now, not that I couldn't have, not that anything, you know, I, I had such a good reputation, 
stand-up guy. Everybody knew it. It, it, it. You don't know when you're dealing with people that are just a different breed than you are. Or not even that you know they are because you might be that way. It, it, I mean, I remember sp speaking to Vic on the yard, guys on the yard. They all know what happened. They say, you're all right. Don't worry about it. We got you. We got What do you mean you got me? You're in another unit. Yeah, they know we're all connected. But, man, people don't give a fuck. I see people get killed for a lot less in prison than what happened with me. I have to say, when they called me, when they come around at like 1 at night, 1230. Lord and pack up. It's the fucking you scream. Woo! Biggest feeling in the world is like, wow. And you know now, everybody's locked in. You pack up your shit. You get everything. I gave a lot of shit away already. Shit I didn't want. You can't take the fuck books with you. And, and it was just something like, holy shit, I'm getting out of it. And then you go down into the cages where they process you out. And I'm the happiest fucking guy in the camp. Now, there's new dudes coming into the prison. And I'm, you know, trying to say, hey, yeah, listen, go see this dude. He's a good dude. Go see this dude. You get to talking. Hey, you go tell him Larry, you know, met you in the cage. He said, go see you, whoever it is. And then we get to know each other. You know, that's how you, the, the people know from prison to prison. We know each other. We ended up, it's a very small system when you think of it. It's big. But when you're in it and for so long, it becomes a small system. So I'll never forget those last 10 days, which is the worst 10 days of my life. And I'll never forget that. And I don't want you to fucking have to go through anything like that. Please comment. You know I'm going to comment afterwards. Please share. Subscribe if you haven't. And if you haven't done all that, please also put your notifications on. And, and you'll know when we come out with new videos, which is quite often again. Thank you very much, everybody, for all your support. I love it. I love telling the stories. Because I hope people just realize they shouldn't go there to have any stories. Stay out of prison. That's not the right place. Make one good choice a day. Be a better person than you were today, tomorrow, and you're going to have a great life. Have a great day, everybody. Stay strong. See you in a couple days.